Thanks. So hi, everyone. I'm Zach. I'm a, I'm a PhD student, and I'm working in computer systems and operating systems. And so I've been developing uh, an operating system called Multiplic um, in Beat. And so I'm going to talk about that and my experiences with that uh, today. So first to start, you know, why would you want to build a kernel? Uh, well, for me, I'm uh, you know involved in, in operating systems research, and so I want to have a, a small kernel that's easy to experiment with and you know try out new ideas and one that I can understand. And so it's definitely useful for me. But in general, I think you know understanding what goes on underneath applications is educational, and the best way to learn is to go out and build it. And it's a lot of fun too, especially nowadays uh, with these cheap single board computers like Raspberry Pis. It's really satisfying to get your code running like on actual hardware rather than just in a simulator. And so the Raspberry Pi makes that really easy. So, uh, just a little overview of Multiplex. It's just a, it's a small Unix-like kernel. I've been working on it uh, for, uh, you know, basically the past year. Um, and it's around 6,500 lines of D. Uh, it supports a couple of different boards, uh, ARM and RISC-5. So it supports some Raspberry Pis. And then there's also these Vision 5 boards which have been coming out, which are sort of like Raspberry Pi equivalents but running with 5 processors. Uh, and then, you know, I'm hoping that as I go forward in my research, uh, I'll be able to build on this kernel um, and, you know, lay the foundation for future projects as well. And so in this talk, I'm going to first give an overview of what brought me to be and then how to use it for bare metal programming, how to get started with that. And then I'll tell you about how I use it in Multiplic, what I found is good for bare metal programming with B, and, you know, what sort of style I like to use. And then also some information about uh, what I've been focusing on with Multiplic. At the end of the talk, I'll talk about some future directions and future projects I'm interested in. You know, systems languages are a crowded market. There are a lot of languages that you could use, especially um, also for embedded programming. And so why did I want to use D? Uh, I think the main thing was that, well, one, it was familiar. So, you know, prior coursework, I had used C, and I had, uh, you know, previous implementations that were in C, and so uh, it was important to be able to uh, sort of keep all that knowledge uh, with me. Um, another thing is that I find D to be very ergonomic. So I have used Rust a little bit, and I think one thing that Rust struggles with is, is being ergonomic, especially for unsafe code. So in a kernel, uh, one of the most common data structures is a, link, a doubly linked list, and that's kind of a mess to work with in Rust. Um, and also, uh, just in general, for the unsafe components, um, that can be also difficult, especially since um, unsafe in Rust is still quite unstable and, uh, you know, a work in progress. Um, but D also brings some safety to the table, which is nice. So uh, it doesn't go as far as Rust, but, you know, we get bounce check slices and some nice type safety, and so I think it really uh, meets a nice middle ground there. And then D is a language that's been around for a while, has multiple compiler implementations, you can use that for, you know, sort of uh, tapping into both the, the GPC and LLVM ecosystems and being able to cross-check uh, across both, you know, um, the, the result of compiling using both compilers. Um, so that uh, just gives more more confidence in the, in the implementation, I think, to have multiple uh, versions of the compiler. Um, and then at the end of the day, it's easy to get started with and fun to, fun to use, but that keeps me around as well. So I want to give a little bit of a, an overview, tutorial-like thing about how might you actually get started writing bare metal code. I'm going to go with uh, the Raspberry Pi. So I have a write-up online, um, and that targets risk 5 I decided for this talk, I'd, give it, uh, I, I'd, uh, I'd target the Raspberry Pi and, and talk about ARM a little bit, but they should be uh, pretty much the same. You know, I had to go with, if you're in the UK, I had to go with the, the home favorite with ARM. Um, and so uh, you have to end up using LDC or GDC, because uh, DMD doesn't support um, and on back end. But uh, LDC and GDC are both great and they support it. Um, and so from the software side, you might also want Cumi, which is used for simulation. Um, and then uh, if you actually want to run it in hardware, then uh, you need a board and an SD card and uh, also this serial connector, which allows the, uh, which allows your computer and the board to communicate using pretty, like a simple protocol um, called UART for sending bytes back and forth over a wire. So, what is bare metal programming? So normally, when you write code, right, your program runs within the context of the operating system. And the operating system provides all sorts of utilities for you, like a file system, you know, the abstraction of running multiple processes, being able to, to show things on the display, all sorts of very useful things. But unfortunately, when you're writing bare metal code, when you're writing the operating system itself, all that is not there for you. So, all that you get is, uh, is the hardware environment. You, you go and you download the data sheet for whatever board you're using, and the data sheet tells you that the, the CPU, when it boots up, will begin executing at a certain address. And uh, there's also like a, a portion of memory that is devoted to peripherals, so any of the devices on the board. And then 
There's going to be documentation, hopefully, often not actually, but uh, documentation for each device explaining how it can be controlled by reading writing from the special memory information. So on the Raspberry Pi in particular, on the right here, this is what the sort of memory map looks like if you go and look at the data sheet. So there are a couple regions in physical memory um, that are just general purpose RAM, so those are the SD RAM regions, and for the ARM is the CPU, and the DC, that's the video core. Um, so, you know, when you're, when you're writing CPU code, you don't use this memory, but you can use any of the programming. And then the yellow memory is going to be memory mapped devices. So that's where you read and write to control the devices. It's not real memory. And so the way the Raspberry Pi boots up is at first uh, the GPU actually does this. It loads some binaries off the SD card, a firmware binary and a kernel binary. And then the CPU starts executing at address zero, which ends up running the firmware. And then the firmware will, will jump to a certain predefined address. And our code, which is going to be in the kernel binary, is running. So before I get into it a little bit, I'm just going to give a, a quick overview of ARM and, and what's important for the following slide. So the CPU is ultimately going to be running ARM machine code. The brief overview is that you have a bunch of registers, you have a stack pointer, it's a load store architecture, so that means that if you want to interact with memory, there are specific load and store instructions, and all other instructions, for the most part, are going to be arithmetic instructions between registers. And then there are four exception levels, so the hardware provides some support for security, essentially, and there's a user mode, kernel mode, hypervisor mode, and firmware. So there's four exception levels on ARM, and uh, each one basically allows the, the one below it to, you know, it, it, it puts it in a, in a sort of sandbox environment where uh, in order to access, uh, it, it can, you know, a higher privilege level can restrict the behavior of those privilege levels. So, in order to set up a bare metal environment for running deep code, you first need to have an assembly that runs. And the assembly is going to set up a valid stack pointer. So, when, when a deep function runs, it expects there to be a real value in the stack pointer. And then you also, if you're going to use global variables, which you probably will, uh, you need an initialized block start segment, so the BSS segment. So when the compiler compiles your program into a machine code image, it's going to put like a text segment containing all the machine instructions, some data segment for global variables, and then any global variables that are initialized to zero, these are expressed in the BSS segment, which is not actually stored in the binary. It's start and end addresses are stored in the binary, and it's expected that Either when the operating system loads, if you're an application, when the operating system loads your binary, it'll set up the BSS to be all zeros, or if you're bare, running bare metal enough to do it yourself. And so in this code, we first, you know, we're going to load some value in the stack pointer, and then have a little loop that runs and uh, stores zero into all the addresses within the BSS. Once you do this, you can have a, a branch instruction that calls name, which is going to look like some empty function written in D. And so at that point, you're safe, you're running, you're running D code. So to actually compile D code to run bare metal, uh, D compilers will expect uh, this object.d file, um, and it usually contains some, some core definitions for the D runtime. And uh, in the simplest, the simplest object.d file that you can have is uh, basically an empty one. And you know, then you don't have any, you really don't have any uh, any built-in uh, D runtime features, but it will compile, and, and you'll be able to use uh, a restricted subset of the language. And then as your project advances, you can add support in object.p for, for things like basic types and assertions and other built-ins. And often you can, you can go and look at the object.p that gets shipped with the user mode version of LVC or whatever, and you can, you can copy over code or adapt it to your custom runtime. OK, so now we have some empty function, empty D function that runs. How do you actually get it to do something? Well, uh, basically the main thing you can, you can, you know, to view output from it, you have to have it transmit something over the UART device. Uh, so it's going to send some bytes over uh, this, over the wire when you connect it to your host computer. And to control the UART device, you need to write a, a small device driver, essentially, or you know, it's really not even a device driver at this point. It's just uh, going to be controlling the device registers. So if you look in the data sheet, you'll see something like this. Uh, if you, you know, scroll to the UART section, and this is a, a cut out a bunch of the wording, but it, it, it basically is saying that at this address, uh, there are these registers that control various things. And one of them is this mini UART IO data. So that's at offset 0x40. So if you have that here, that'll be the address of this, uh, this particular register. And if you go and read about the mini UART IO data, it says that there are 
depending on various configurations, it does different things. But um, if VLAB is zero and you write to the bottom eight bits, then the data written is going to be put in the transmit cipher and it's going to transmit those bits over the wire. So we can just take that address and we can, you know, cast it to a pointer and then store it. Uh, you know, we love we love casting integer literals into pointers here. Um, <laughs> so uh, of course you want to uh, you're going to you know uh, this is the hello world example. Um, that you would want to wrap this in, or wrap this in like a device driver, and, and then maybe implement like a print line around it, and then you can start getting real debugging information as you run, and you can start actually getting output uh, from your code, and you can go from there. All right. So in general, what the bare metal development experience is like is I mostly use Kinu for prototyping. So Kinu can you can ask it to emulate a Raspberry Pi, for example, and it will emulate all the devices. Uh, or many of them, including the UART. And so when you run that code, uh, what you'll see is that actually it'll, just, it'll act like a UART, it'll print out on your screen. Uh, and then, uh, so that, that's really nice for quick testing because you don't always want to have the board plugged into your computer. But sometimes you, you often you do need to run on the actual hardware. And taking your binary and possibly putting it on an SD card and plugging that in, and you find out there's a bug and you take the SD card out and you rewrite it, that's very annoying. So, um, to, to make that a smoother experience, you can use a, a UART bootloader. So this is a program that runs. It's always on the SD card, and whenever the Pi boots up, it runs, and it sends some pings over the UART to the host computer, and then when the host is ready, so then it's just like a program command, and you have a, a program on the host computer that sends over some binary over the UART, and the, the bootloader on the Pi will receive that binary, copy it into memory, and jump to it. And so this way, uh, if you want, if you have a bug in your program, you need, to, you need to restart it, or you want to send a new program, you just restart the Pi. You don't need to mess with the SD card. Just restart it and then send, uh, send over the UART again. You got a comment or a question? I, I did uh, some single board computers back in the ancient times, and you're talking about what a burden it is to put it on an SD card and plug it in. Well, it does. <laughs> those days, we had things called EPROM, or Erasable proms, and what you do is you burn it into the prom. Well, if you made a mistake or a bug, you got to take it out and put it under the UV light for a half hour to erase it. <laughs> burn another one, and at least that was better than you had to buy a new prom. <laughs> no, I just have to laugh when you say, "Oh, oh, I have to." <laughs> yeah, we're, we're living in luxury here. Okay, so moving into the second part, I'm now going to talk a bit more about multiplex in particular. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, as I said, a small, unique like kernel. Um, it's got some fancy processes, got a, set, a simple set of system calls, a simple Unix v6 style file system. Um, it's got some partial multi core support. I'm still working on that, but it can boot up all the cores. And then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, in the future, I hope to, uh, to get it working better uh, for multi core. Uh, and then it, it can be built with. LDC or GDP, and I'm now going to talk about you know what sort of things I I guess my experience um, using this uh, EVD for, for kernel development. Um, so I've been sticking to I've been trying to stick to like a, a keep it simple style. I guess I come from a you know in the desert world of C programming, so that, that's very Spartan I guess, and all these new features of D are, are very appealing. But I've been trying to sort of restrict uh, my usage as much as possible. Um, but the big features that I really like. Uh, really find useful are, of course, modules, built-in slices with bound stacking. Uh, that is very useful. Um, and then things like the defer for resource management and even tons of minor things that are much better than C. And in more of the library code for the operating system, I also make use of templates and destructors and integrators and the nicer features. But there are some exceptions to this, so I'm going to give an example. There are system registers. Uh, these control the machine configuration, and they're, they're read or written with the special MRS or MSR instruction. Uh, and so I have this mixing, which is very nice for um, creating a really nice interface for executing these system registers. So it's just a, a function that has an inline assembly in it, and so then you can, you can generate all these functions for each register. There are tons of them, tons of registers for controlling the ARM, you know, whatever, the, the page table base address, and uh, all sorts of configuration for what mode you're running in and all sorts of things like that. So there's tons of these registers, and then uh, you can use the, the nice syntax that you provide for the functions with assignments, essentially. And 
these registers look like they're just fields. And this is very convenient, and I've used like the equivalent versions in C and Rust where you have to use macros, and you still end up with a worse interface. Another area that's, uh, that's important and I think is very helpful for is uh, shared memory, handling shared memory. So in, in C, you just have your globals and you just, you just have at it. Uh, there's nothing in the language to really help you out. Um, so the first thing that you might do uh, for managing global data is just make it CPU local. Uh, so it's not quite the same as thread local because often the, the, the operating system has threads within it and then you don't want uh, when the thread migrates from a core to another core, you actually you want the CPU local data to be not preserved because it's, it's per CPU, so it's, it's some information that's like the current CPU's you know wait queue or something like that. Um, so, but we can really easily do that with this simple struct uh, that has you, you wrap some data with the per CPU value, and then it actually expands it into an array where there's one for each core, and uh, and it uses this art read CPU function, which gives the current CPU ID. And so each CPU will use a different value, and you can safely, it's you know, safely not actually shared. You can pass through the, the shared as well as that. Another thing that's really useful is uh, the, the sort of Rust style, or I've seen, like I said, it's the uh, library for the Rust, the, the, the style of, of lock um, for doing shared uh, data. So what the interface looks like is you make a mutex. Uh, you wrap some data with VTEX, and then when you want to uh, actually access the underlying data, you construct a guard from that mutex. And then the guard uh, it gives you access to the underlying value, and the guard automatically handles locking the lock and then unlocking it when it goes out of scope. And you could, you could use a, 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 an interface that looks more like this, where you have a lock function. It's a bit nicer. I think this relies on the name return value optimization, and I couldn't find whether this is guaranteed or not. So. I have sort of two different flavors of this, uh, but they're mostly the same. I still the constructed version, though. Um, and all this is, so these mutexes are built on top of some sort of spin lock primitive implemented with Atomic. So, you know, that's, people are asking about use cases for Atomic. So, one big use case is just to implement your uh, spin lock primitive. So, this is a bit small, I guess, but the, uh, I'll, I'll zoom in on the important values. So, this is what the mutex implementation looks like. It stores some data. Uh, it stores. It has a. It stores a spin lock as well, and then it has this next to guard struct. And so the guard struct in particular, you construct it by giving it a mutex, and it stores a reference to that mutex, um, and it automatically locks the mutex when when you construct it. So then, once you have the guard, you know the mutex must have been locked. So that means it takes access to the underlying value within the mutex. So you can just pass away the shared qualifier and return that value, and only use it once. And then, if the guard goes out of scope, then the mutex gets unlocked. And so this is sort of the, the rough style of like, uh, safe access to global, um, global mutable data. Um, so there is a, there are some use cases for G-shared as well. I think uh, you know sometimes you sometimes it is uh, useful to manually protect data with a lock, uh, even if you can't prove to the compiler that it's safe, or the the data is used during either a you know, single core context, like during during boot or something like that. Um, so, or maybe you only in it, ever enable one core. So, I think uh, you know there there just has its use. I do have an, a slight annoyance that it, it comes with a double underscore because uh, it, yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> I know there, yeah, there are other unsafe features that don't have the underscore. But I understand. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, the allocator API. Uh, is like a much um, a much nicer version than you know what you get with C because you use templates to have it be type based so it's simple it's typed and it, this means it's actually tracking like you can have it provide the sizes right so now the allocator the underlying allocator does not need to be tracking sizes on its own usually when you write a C allocator you have to have the allocator store those sizes somewhere so that it can know and so that's a, a, a nice benefit um, and you know this is manual memory management but uh, I would be interested in trying to implement a garbage collector. Uh, for bare metal uh, in the future, uh, so I think I think garbage collectors are pretty underrated. Garbage collectors are great, so I, I would I would like to look that. Okay, so using both compiler tool chains, since both of them support the targets we want, we want to use both of them, and they're mostly compatible. There are just you know some slight differences and some built-ins and the inline assembly stuff. So, for example, for making system calls in particular, where you want to store arguments in specific registers and then execute the instruction, LDC has some syntax for that. CDC has this register keyword for doing that. 
kind of sort of has to split it up. But otherwise, very compatible. Um, another thing I do for the uh, architecture specific code is each architecture gets its own subdirectory, and then at the higher level arch directory, there's like a module that's sort of a sub module for each one that public imports uh, the, the correct module. Uh, and then, so in the architecture independent area, you just import the you know, click.arch.vm module, and you'll get either the RISC or AR64 version, which should have the same, they have the same interface, and so you, you transparently get the right version. Okay. So I also have a general interest in, um, in my research for tools for automated bug finding. And so one thing I'm interested in looking at is uh, what kind of analysis tools exist for D, and, uh, and also is it, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about making some custom tools too. So on the static analysis side, there's vScanner and there's the GDC analyzer as well, which can be used um, via GDC. So this gives you things like unused variables and unused return values and also qualifiers, which are, you know, this sort of minor linking, but it's, it's very useful for finding things you didn't need to do. And then the GCC analyzer can do more aggressive analysis, so it can find things like unsafe pointer accesses or, or things like that. I do find that the GCC analyzer, I have trouble getting it to work well with C. I, it's made for C, and uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, you, when you use the more advanced features of D, it tends to get tripped up. So that's one reason also that I, I like to stick to a simpler, uh, simpler style of D, but it would be cool to try to expand the GCC analyzer to have a better understanding of, of detail. On the dynamic analysis side, so this is where uh, the compiler or somehow you're going to instrument the code so that it will check the bugs as it's running. Uh, there's the GCC sanitizer. So on, in user mode, uh, this is things like F sanitized address. So the compiler will instrument the code before the load and store and have some checks that run automatically. And then I also have some custom tools for this. So in particular, this is the, the sanitizer is good for finding memory management bugs and undefined behavior. And then some custom tools uh, that I have are good for finding things like race conditions, some cache mismanagement, and maybe bugs in device code, things like that. Some more custom uh, project specific tools. Um, so I also want to want to do a little bit more. I want to explain a little bit more about the sanitizer and how to use the, the GCC sanitizer uh, in bare metal code. So. Usually, when you use the GCC sanitizer and pass in dash F sanitize equals address or something like that, uh, you, the GCC comes with a sanitizer library that implements all the callbacks for when a load or store happens, what kind of checking should it do. But when you're running bare metal, that's not going to work because, you know, what it does when it, when it fails a check is maybe it tries to print something. And, well, there's no, there's no print system call. There's no write system call. Instead, you have to write that library yourself. And so you can ask uh, for the kernel address sanitizer. In this setting, it, it sort of simplifies what it tries to instrument. And it really just gives you loads and stores. So there are a bunch of functions that are called that look like this. And if you implement them, then you can get callbacks on loads and stores. And so to implement a very simple sanitizer in the same style as the address sanitizer, you can use this shadow memory technique where basically for every byte of memory in the heap or in some region that you're interested in finding bugs in, you have some shadow memory that's stored somewhere else. And that it has a bunch of bits that track for each byte. Is it free or is it allocated? And then when you have a load or store happen, you check in the shadow memory. Is it loading or storing free memory? If so, seems bad. Um, and then you have to update the, the shadow memory whenever you allocate or free something. So this is like a very simple version of the sanitizer, the GCC sanitizer uh, that um, you can run on bare metal code. So and a, a problem is if you want to run, if you want to write custom tools, that, uh, that custom dynamic analysis tools for a kernel or something, you run into problems because, well, writing, writing new instrumentation for, for a compiler is kind of complicated. You have to understand the compiler. You have to, uh, you, have to you know, maybe that ties into a particular compiler, things like that. Then there's the, the problem. So another solution is dynamic recompilation, which is the Valgrind approach to, to uh, dynamic analysis. But Valgrind is some massive tool, and you don't want to be having some dynamic JIT running. So uh, a simple solution is just to use hardware breakpoints and watch points to do dynamic analysis. So the hardware comes with support for a breakpoint, which you configure the breakpoint, and then what happens is the hardware will give you a debug exception when, it, when the CPU reaches that address. And watch points are similar. You configure the watch point so that it, looks, it watches a, a range of addresses, 
for Congress. And then when 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 the processor attempts to load a store uh, an address in that range, the CPU generates a debug exception. And so if you put it, you can have this sort of dynamic analysis by by putting an automated checker in the privilege level above where the kernel runs, so it's the hypervisor mode, and then uh, using catching these events via via breakpoints and watchpoints that might be useful for data analysis. And it, it lets us write really simple checkers. It is quite slow. You know, generating crash all the time is really slow, but it's only able to debug and run. You can let it run for a while. Um, so I think it, it can be worth it for the simplicity. Um, so I'm going to give an example, or a couple examples of different, different checkers. One technique for finding data races is the data collider technique, which was some technique published at OSDI in 2010. And it can be re implemented using this debugging hardware approach. So, what the goal here is is to just sort of induce data races to happen and find out when they do. So, you set a range watch point on your heap or wherever you want to check for data races. When a loader store happens, you get a debug exception and you record that address into a table and then you start delaying for maybe like one to five seconds or one millisecond or whatever. And then, as another core is running, it also will have a watch point configured and it might get a crack from the loader store. And when it does, it will check whether it's addressed that's been tracked within the table. And so, and that's a database, right? Because it may have happened differently, like this delay might not have happened. And so, it's possible for those two, that, that memory could have been read and written, or, or written and written by both threads at the same time. So, it's a database. So, it's a really simple, you know, implementation, something like 50 lines of code or something. Uh, so, it's, it's a very nice little, little checker for kernel code to find databases. Okay, another thing is uh, the, the cache checker. So, when the, when I, one example of where this might come up is when the operating system loads a process, what it generally does is it loads the, uh, the binary for that process into memory, and then it jumps to that, that process's entry point. But there's a problem. So, for example, in the RISC-5 spec, it says stores to instruction memory, or any memory, because it's you know, instruction memory and data memory, it doesn't make sense won't be visible to instruction specters until you execute a particular instruction. And this is because there's a, there's a split data cache and instruction cache, and it would be inefficient, I guess, to make them coherent with each other. So if you store into the data if you make a store that goes into the data cache, and if you try to fetch, like for uh, executing an instruction, it will load from the instruction cache. So whenever you uh, are doing some sort of dynamic rewriting where you're about to, you're about to execute in, uh, memory that you just stored, which is what Loading processes essentially, uh, you need to execute some fence instruction first. So, we can make an automated checker for this. Uh, you can you know, use track for single stepping to just record uh, the right memory into the table, uh, create the table when a fence happens, and then uh, if the program counter is ever in the table, then you know that uh, there was a right to memory and then you try to execute it before there was a fence in between. Uh, so, that, that was the specification. And I have a, there's also a similar checker, another cache that the operating system has to maintain, uh, a hardware cache with the, the CLB, and so there's sort of a similar thing for that as well. I'll we'll talk about that more uh, later. Um, so I also want to talk about the, the build system that I've been using. So before working on Multiplex, I was working on this build system called NIT. Uh, it was sort of, yeah, it, it was uh, just trying to be like a generic build system, and uh, then when I started Multiplex, I, you know, of course, had to had to try to use uh, use NIT for the as a build system for it. And uh, in doing so, I also realized that there was an optimization that I wanted to make that would really benefit uh, in particular, and uh, in particular for making parallel and incremental builds. So I'll just give a brief overview of NIT. Uh, first, the uh, so it's, it's a it's a general build tool um, like Make, and the way it works is. You write uh, a NIT file, which is essentially just a Lua program, and then at some point within your what, the, this, uh, this Lua pro program will return a set of rules. Each rule begins with a dollar sign, and these rules are written in a very make make like style. So this is no longer Lua code; right? this is some sort of embedded make language. And so this expresses like a make. Uh, it's sort of like make, but where the new make sort of weird language is replaced with Lua. And so for for making you know, simple incremental build for a few projects, you have this sort of um, this sort of rule set, and then you get a graph for you know, depending on what files you have in front of you. 
when you actually build it, it'll validate this graph with the, with the recipes that you have for each year. So for D, I wanted to have, I maybe over engineered the build system because uh, I was interested in it, but it, you know, my, the project was not that good, so I didn't need to go to this, all, all this effort. But, uh, but the, the approach that I took was um, when you change a module, like C.D, um, then you only need to actually rebuild that, uh, or you, you only need to rebuild all modules that depend on it, like that import it, if the, if the API from that module has changed. Right? So that's like the function signature uh, in that module. And, and we have this really nice feature that you can generate these interface files uh, for each uh, source file. And so the interface file is, is, is essentially expresses the API, right? It expresses all the, uh, all the function signatures without the bodies and anything that needs to be imported, but, um, but otherwise keeping out the, the things that aren't necessarily going to be visible to, um, to application or modules that are importing the current one. Okay, so in a small example here, what we want is that if you have like a max.d file and that changes, then you want your build to first generate the .di header file, and then if the header is unchanged from the prior build, then you only rebuild that current object file, right? You don't need to, you don't need to rebuild anyone, any, any modules that import from that from module. That gives you really fast uh, incremental compiles because it, as long as you're only changing like, function bodies that are not being exported to function signatures, then you only need to rebuild that one file. And then if you do end up changing the function signature, it'll have to rebuild it from all the files that import that module, and that, that information can be uh, retrieved from like LDC or CDDCs and some make files. Make has a feature that I implemented for this purpose in particular, which basically checks if a file that is just rebuilt is actually unchanged from the previous build using, you know, hashing regardless of timestamp. And so if it actually sees that a file is unchanged as it was building, it will skip the dependencies in the build graph. So for example, there's a dependency here that like main imports max, and therefore if I change max, I'll have to uh, I'll have to rebuild main. But actually if max.di is unchanged, this arrow gets deleted and it doesn't end up never ends up building this, this other side of the subgraph. So you get the benefit of basically using incremental like the, the, the header files to give you incrementality, but you can automatically generate all these files. Uh, and then also, I should note that, um, like, if you use templates a lot, this isn't going to help you because uh, templates get exported as to the, you know, the API of your module. And so, whenever you change a template, even if it's just a body of some templated function or something, that's still going to get exported because uh, the, whoever's importing that, that function still needs to be able to resolve that template. When they have the input, so they need to be able to view the body. So, so that sort of exports your implementation type and causes uh, worse incrementality. Okay, so uh, at the end of the talk here, I just want to give uh, sort of an overview of where I, where I want to go. Um, so, future, future projects that build on MultiClick. So, um, I'm actually, I'm, so uh, there are practically open systems use hardware to protect. To, to isolate uh, processes, right? So um, when you have multiple processes, you don't have to be able to read each other's memory. The typical way to do this is with hardware protection via page tables and stuff. Um, but there are techniques for isolating processes without that hardware protection, only using software. And so one example is WebAssembly. And there was like a kernel from a while ago called Singularity that also did this. There's also another approach called software fault isolation, which was the main technique behind Google Native Client. Actually, I'm curious, how many people have heard of Google Native Client? How many people have heard of WebAssembly? Okay, a lot more. So yeah, uh, WebAssembly is sort of, Native Client was the predecessor to WebAssembly and sort of fell out of favor uh, in WebAssembly's portfolio. Uh, so, but I, I think there were still some good ideas there. And what I'm interested in exploring is building a new system that is also based on SFI and using that for process isolation. Maybe you can run all the processes in kernel mode and single address space and use software techniques to isolate the processes rather than hardware protection, which can be slow when you need to change the protection domain, so when you need a context switch, when you need a system call, you incur a lot of overhead. Maybe you can make that, you know, a couple orders, orders of magnitude faster. That's where I want to go with this project. Um, that's the end of the talk. So, uh, thank you, and I, I'll take any questions. A couple of things. Sometimes I peruse lists of uh, sources of uh, 
clubs and chicken salsa, and always at the top of the list are array overflows. So I know you talk about a lot about security stuff in there or finding bugs, but really uh, having the array bounds checking is the is the number one feature for uh, uh, heading off of bugs. Um, and second, we have a question. You and the uh, compiler's inline assembly be used to write the startup code? Um, yeah, I think it can. So you can avoid using the uh, assembler and do everything in D then? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, sometimes, you know, if you're writing a lot of assembly, the having it be in its own assembly file is somewhat nice, but I think it should it could definitely be just in a D file as in my assembly. Um, I, I think it, it might depend on uh, whether you can make I think GGC has support for so-called like naked assembly functions, which are just functions that contain inline assembly and don't have the, the sort of uh, post the preamble and the, the epilogue or the, the prologue and epilogue for saving and storing the stack pointer that you don't want if you're um, putting direct inline assembly in that's supposed to be the, the first function or the first branch point for the whole thing. But, but yeah, I think uh, provided that exists, then it would be possible. Well, I really enjoyed your talk because, you know, I remember writing a code like that and how similar it is. It hasn't changed all that much in a, in a long time. But anyhow, really cool. Thank, thank you. Out of interest, what's the most complicated thing you've actually run in um, user space in the team? Uh, yeah, so currently the user space is, is not very uh, fleshed out, but it's, uh, it has a test program that, that uh, reads from the file system, reads the file, and then uh, executes a bunch of like fork, forking and waiting as a, as a test of uh, the system calls. But yeah, I want to. Uh, I'd like to build out a little, a little shell and some, some additional utilities. Okay, so your next thing, uh, the it's a nice idea that they, they generate the generate the DI files and then go the DI file has it changed. And I think that uh, lining will break that. Um, wh what do you mean? So if uh, so a dot you know a dot b imports b dot d. So a dot o depends on uh, b dot d. So a dot o could uh, when built have inlined bodies of functions defined in b dot d. So yeah, and then I think if, if it's inlined the functions, then that should be fine. Like it doesn't need to uh, doesn't need to it doesn't need to rebuild again. Um, it's just then you could end up with an inconsistent thing because if you change b dot d. Uh, you could change the implementation of something in B.D. A.O. will still have the inline uh, previous implementation. Um, uh, we can talk to Scott. I think, <laughs> <laughs> think inlining should only occur at, uh, like, it shouldn't. Um, okay, maybe we should talk about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you were talking about. Um, uh, UP Sun and A Sun. So uh, I tried to use uh, A Sun and UB Sun in, in LDC. LDC doesn't support UB Sun right now. And A Sun uh, has some problems with the leak detection. Uh, did you find anything in the GDC uh, that has got some false positives? Um, so uh, I haven't been using the user space version of the uh, UB Sun and, and, and uh, I just want to try to, but yeah, but, in, on the but I haven't, I haven't found uh, any issues. Okay, well, I found a lot. So <laughs> maybe I'll send you. Uh, maybe the, uh, you know, I don't know if the issues were in in the in the library that that uh, GDC or something provides, since that's been cut out, right? Like I am providing my own simpler implementation and a, a more restrictive implementation. Uh, like for example, uh, UB Sun is not supported on LDC at all. Okay. Yeah, I haven't been using the, the sanitizers from LBC at all. Okay, okay, great. So uh, not, maybe I should use the yeah, yeah. So the idea of uh, having the process isolation be done in software, so and uh, process isolation and all the other things that you might want to do. Uh, you were saying it's expensive to split those exception levels. Is that inherently expensive in the hardware, or is it simply expensive because of all the work? That is traditionally done when you switch into kernel mode. You know, you like save all these registers, reset a whole bunch of state, change all the like, or, or, or trash all the uh, like memory, like, like 
is it um, is it infringing at all? Yeah, I think there is some inherent uh, there is some inherent performance that's lost because the, the especially on modern high performance processors that are doing a lot of speculation and stuff like that, um, they have to they have to flush a bunch of information from their pipeline when you change the security mode or something like that. So. So there is some inherent uh, performance issue. And then I think also, if you take a software approach, you can do better on, on even just the saving and the storing of registers and things like that, because uh, you, can, you can have a system call that sort of goes directly to the right address in the, in the kernel, rather than needing to go through some sort of switch statement, essentially, uh, first. Yeah. All right, I think we're done with questions. So uh, thank you.